This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. Alpha Natural Resources, an energy company dedicated to respecting the land. Alpha Natural Resources, we power the world through the energy of our people. Haley Buick GMC, the place for a new Verano or Terrain Denali. In Richmond and online at HaleyBuickGMC.com. Everywhere there are lighting poles, there's one more opportunity to save money. Intelligent Illuminations provides cost-effective wireless lighting solutions for roadway or area outdoor lights. Kanawha Valley Arena, Virginia's cowboy town, hosting an array of events from Civil War reenactments to diesel truck pulls. More information online at virginiarodeo.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community. Working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. So what do you do? Information about getting involved in advanced technology careers, making everything from clean energy to life-saving medicine, is available at dreamitdoitvirginia.com. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. This week in Richmond, and a very special welcome to Congressman Bobby Scott. Uh, when I first met you way back in 1983, you were a member of the Senate of Virginia. Okay. After already having served four years in the House of Delegates, you served in the Senate of Virginia on up to 92, and when you were elected at that time, began serving the 3rd Congressional District in 1993. Right. We very much appreciate your being on this week in Richmond and helping our viewers better understand either what's not happening or what is happening, however you want to express it about uh, north of the Potomac and, and Congress. So uh, let me help us out. I was actually five years in the House of Delegates. But the, on, um, in, in Washington, I guess the major issue really is, is the government shutdown, which is just, uh, just totally unacceptable and unnecessary. Um, in the early 90s, um, Clinton and Newt Gingrich, President Clinton and Speaker Gingrich could not agree on the budget, and there was a government shutdown. They couldn't agree on the budget. This time, in order to keep the government open after the House had passed a budget and the Senate had passed a budget, rather than negotiate, the Senate decided not to go halfway or two-thirds of the way, but just agreed to the House budget for the purpose of keeping the government open while we negotiate it. So people said that no, no one was negotiating, there was nothing to negotiate. What happened is totally unprecedented. Coming out of the blue, they said, well, we're not going to, even though we've agreed on the budget, unless we get more uh, significant changes in Obamacare, they're going to let the government get shut down. Now, once you start letting people get legislative advantage over a, th a threat for government shutdown or threatening on the debt ceiling, you've really opened up the um, process to total dysfunction. Suppose the Democrats, for example, said, unless we get immigration reform or gay marriage or gun safety or jobs bill, we're going to shut down the government and mean it and government will get shut down unless the, somebody uh, agreed. And that's why the um, president said he, you just can't negotiate under those circumstances. Now, the Republicans had reason to believe that the Democrats would cave because we have. That's how they got the sequester. They're going to threaten on the debt ceiling, exploding the economy, unless we agree to some sequester. And the president said, oh, we can't have the debt ceiling. So we agreed to the sequester, across the board cuts, wrecking defense particularly and social programs and everything else in government, and um, ended up with the sequester. And at this point, I think it occurred to the president, so long as you give legislative advantage to these threats, you'll have more and more. Um, 
unfortunately for the Republicans, the Nation magazine actually printed a list that uh, they had been circulating around of things they wanted that they were going to get on the debt ceiling after, in the middle of the government shutdown. Obamacare, cuts in Social Security and Medicare, corporate tax relief, mm. um, uh, Keystone Pipeline, mm -hmm. uh, on and on, um, things that they were going to get by threatening to, 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 to basically destroy the economy. And at that point, it, be, it became clear that you cannot give anything. You just have to say, no, we're not just not going to negotiate outside of the budget. Um, and, and, and we took that stand, and in the fullness of time, uh, the Senate passed a uh, resolution, so-called clean continuing resolutions, clean CR, uh, where we kept the government open just by agreeing to the, to the um, number in the Republican budget for the next couple of weeks. Now, that only gets us to January. Uh, we have a very severe problem trying to figure out because the cuts that would be necessary to get down to the uh, Republican budget numbers are numbers that you, you can't pass appropriations bills with that number. You, nobody wants to put a number on a line item to conform to, that, to, the, to the Republican budget. They couldn't pass at that level a transportation bill because there were such severe cuts in transportation that the Republic, they didn't, Republicans didn't have enough votes to pass it, and, and, and Democrats thought the cuts were too severe. They couldn't call the bill up. Uh, and other, other pieces, like the kid couldn't pass a farm bill. Uh, farm bill came up. The, the cuts are too severe. Um, and, and so you ended up, you can't pass, a, you cannot pass legislation at those numbers. So I don't know what's going to happen uh, in January. Hopefully we'll be able to get through it um, if, I guess, either extend it or whatever, but just not get into another government shutdown. The um, threat on the debt ceiling uh, is, is another concern because nobody really knows what would happen if you uh, froze the debt ceiling and couldn't pay your debts. Nobody knows what would happen because all the economists have concluded that it would have severe, long-lasting, economic, adverse economic uh, consequences to our domestic economy and the global economy. Now, when all the economists agree that it will have devastating effects on the, on, on the economy, that ought to end the debate. <laughs> so, so you don't, well, how bad would it be? Well, well what difference does it make? It, 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 it's a stupid thing to do and we're not going to do it. So there's no point in speculating what, what, what would happen. But the people have said, well, we reopen the government, that's a good thing. But there was significant damage to our economy by fooling with the debt ceiling and threatening mm -hmm. uh, default on our, on, on our debts and, 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 full, and shutting down the government. The Pete Peterson's foundation, he's a former Secretary of Commerce in, in a Republican administration, has a foundation, economic um, policy uh, foundation. They, they estimated that between the threat on the debt ceiling two years ago and the foolishness this time, that we've lost 900,000 jobs. Um, the S&P downgraded us two years ago. Finch Rating Service uh, has put us on a negative watch list. Fidelity Investments sold all their short-term bonds. The interest rates on overnight loans from one bank to another quadrupled since the beginning of the month. And so uh, you look at all the devastating effects it's had, people out of work, not getting paychecks. With all of that, there has been significant adverse effects. We're trying to create uh, 100, 150,000 in a good month. We've been doing about 200,000 uh, jobs over the last 40-some months. We've had positive job growth uh, in the private sector, pointing in the right direction. And here you are with 900,000 jobs all at once. Uh, because of the uh, threats uh, on shutting down the government and threats on the debt ceiling. Uh, so I don't know what's going to happen in uh, January, but I hope those who are claiming to be for jobs would stop uh, messing up the economy and cost us all those jobs. You know, during the time you've been in the House of Representatives, you've been in the majority, you've been in the minority, um, and some of the times when you're in the minority, something that you've just described has not taken place. What? What, in your opinion, is really different about this Congress than, than, than previous ones? Well, I think the, uh, the, the threats on shutting down the government, particularly the unprecedented idea that you'll shut down the government for, for things unrelated to the budget, and threatening on the debt ceiling. Uh, all the debt ceiling does is allow you to pay your debts. Most countries don't even have a debt ceiling. When you pass a budget that has deficits in it and adds to the debt, 
you assume that the debt would go up because you passed the bill. Well, we have a separate vote that we, we, we vote to appropriate the money, then we vote to pay the bills. Um, no one has ever credibly threatened to default on our debts until uh, this bunch came in. Um, uh, you know, people talk about um, the others have voted against it. There have been other riders on the bill. That, that's true. But it's always in the context of, of course, the bill is going to pass. In fact, sometimes you get riders on it because everybody knows the bill will pass. So if you can get your little amendment on it, you know you're in good shape. Never has it been, if I don't get my amendment on the bill, we're going to kill the bill. We'll default on our debts unless I get my way. That is unprecedented. And when the, the, the things are unrelated to, um, uh, to, 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 the, to the budget and, and, and things that aren't going to happen. I mean, most of the members of the Republicans in the Senate, other than the Tea Party group, knew that they were not going to repeal Obamacare. I mean, it was not going to happen. So you're threatening to shut down the government on something you can't get. Um, and so the government just had to, was shut down because they wouldn't pass the uh, uh, continuing resolution to keep it open. And it's one thing not to pass the appropriations bills. That's just a little dysfunctional. Uh, but when you don't have a continuing resolution to keep government open at, at some spending rate, um, because you didn't get your way on some unrelated legislation is unprecedented. And that's uh, what's, uh, what's new with this Congress. You know, since the time that you were serving here in Richmond, the word primary has become a verb form also, <laughs> primaried. And, and there are legislators that, uh, ones that you even served with years ago who have been primaried. Some of them, a few of them, defeated in primaries. Is, is there that kind of fear among some of your colleagues, you think, in, in Congress that, that prevents them from, uh, from perhaps voting to go ahead and keep the government open? I think the um, real key election was the one in Delaware where Mike Castle, who was a former governor, 18-year member of the House of Representatives, extremely popular. I describe his popularity in Delaware similar to John Warner's popularity in Virginia. Um, Joe Biden's son, the Attorney General Bo Biden, did not run for the Senate because Mike Castle was running. Um, he got beat in a primary by the lady who is not a witch, Christine O'Donnell, mm -hmm. um, a candidate right. who had virtually no chance against any Democrat in a general election. But the Tea Party is strong in Republican primaries. And I think most members of Congress looked and concluded that they're not nearly as strong in their district as Mike Castle was in Delaware, and they wouldn't have the nerve to pray for an opponent as weak as Christine O'Donnell. Uh, but she beat him, I and mean, they called the, call, call the election early in the evening. It, it wasn't that close. And they concluded if she can beat him in a primary, then, you know, they, they, they'd be toast if they didn't toe the line right down the line. And, and so the Tea Party has been nominating candidates that, that, have, that can win primaries, but have very little chance of winning general elections. In fact, the uh, U.S. Senate would be by, by most uh, estimates in uh, majority Republican by now, but for the fact that Tea Party candidates ran, Christine o O'Donnell in Delaware, uh, Nevada, uh, Harry Reid was not expected to come back. They nominated a Tea Party candidate. He came back. Colorado, uh, Missouri, and Indiana, uh, where they had the so-called rape candidates. Uh, you know your party's in trouble when somebody asks, well, what's up with the rape candidate? And you have to ask which one. Mm. Um, yes. uh, all of those would have been were expected to be in Republican hands. Um, we would have had an, we would have had another one uh, in, in Alaska. Lisa Mikowski was defeated in a primary by a Tea Party candidate, turned around and ran a write-in campaign. The Tea Party candidate was so weak that she won a write-in campaign to come back to the to, to the U.S. Senate. Uh, so I think they they have good reason to fear. Uh, Tea Party uh, attacks in primaries. Uh, Democrats just stand back and wait because every time they nominate a Tea Party candidate, they are so extreme that they are uh, relatively easy to defeat in um, in, in general elections. Um, but that but the problem is that on the Republican side, the Republican majority in the House, 
uh, many of them are fearful of uh, being primaried. Because the reports that, that we get downstate here in Virginia is that there may be 40, 50, 60 that are genuine Tea Party candidates, but then when you look at the votes, it, it, you could find a number even larger than that who may be concerned, as you were saying, about well, being number, primary. A number of the votes are unanimous. Yeah. Um, if you look at some of the votes to keep government open during the um, uh, shutdown, there was a series of votes. Uh, many of them procedural, but I mean, if 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 a few had broken ranks, um, I think there would have been a floodgate of, um, of of votes that we could have reopened the government. Uh, but on a on unanimous virtue, virtually all of the votes, right up to the last one, where the debt ceiling had gotten implicated. I mean, it's one thing to shut down government and inconvenience everybody and put people out of work and all that. It's another thing to jeopardize the entire international economy. Um, uh, and I think there was a different attitude about the debt ceiling. And when that was part of the vote, uh, we were able to get um, uh, sufficient votes to keep the government open and extend the debt ceiling. I'd point out, though, that a majority of the Republicans voted to keep the government shut down and to default on our debts. Uh, here in Virginia, I think the, the eight Republicans were split four and four in that final vote, that four voted with the three Democrats mm -hmm. to uh, open the government back up and, and approve the debt ceiling. Well, before our, our time gets too close, let's talk some about the committees that you're serving on, some okay. legislation that you're, you're working on. I've looked and seen about a dozen different bills that you've introduced, so I'd, you, you pick out which you'd like to talk about. Well, one of them uh, I'm particularly proud of is the Youth Promise Act, which I've introduced. Um, we've had uh, good success, good support in the House uh, in the last few years, not much in the Senate. We have, um, I think, much better support in the Senate now, so the prospects are a lot better. It looks at our present criminal justice system and notices that uh, we have been codifying slogans and sound bites for years, uh, slogans that have nothing to do with reducing crime. Uh, some are actually counterproductive. I mean, you're talking about three strikes and you're out, where you keep elderly citizens in jail, can't, they can't get up and down the cell block without their walker, and you're spending all that money on them. And what does that do for juvenile crime? Obviously nothing. I mean, it's just a waste of money. Uh, mandatory minimums have been studied. They require judges in many cases to impose sentences that violate common sense. Uh, they've been studied. They do nothing to reduce crime. Uh, compared to regular ordinary sentencing, they waste the taxpayers' money, they discriminate against minorities. Um, they've been studied. Uh, trying more juveniles as adults, if you do the adult crime, you do the adult time, that's been studied and every study has concluded that because the juvenile court judge can provide services for the child that's been in, in, in trouble, um, education, psychological services, even family services, where in criminal court, the judge can only uh, either let them walk out of court on probation, or parole, or lock them up with adult robbers, rapists, drug dealers, and murderers um, for them to live with and associate with. So a couple of years later, guess who's more likely to commit a crime? Mm. If you've sent them to, to adult prison, and these are like individuals. I mean, studies have shown like individuals go to adult court, you're much more likely to commit a crime. So if you codify that sound bite, you've increased the crime rate and wasted the taxpayers' money. We now lock up a higher portion of our population than any country on earth, so much so that the Pew Research Center has concluded that any incarceration rate over 500 per 100,000 is actually counterproductive. You've got so many people with felony records, you've messed up so many families, you've wasted so much money that could have been put to better use that you're actually adding to crime, not detracting from crime. At 500 per 100,000, the United States is at 700 per 100,000 already. Uh, some, uh, some states lock up minorities at the rate of 4,000 per 100,000. Anything over 500, counterproductive. If you were to use a little of that counterproductive money mm -hmm. on comprehensive evidence-based prevention and early intervention strategies, you could significantly reduce crime and other social problems and save money in the process. Every time you've done this, 
they've been successful. Evidence-based is the key because all prevention programs don't work. You have to have been studied and validated as evidence-based, uh, effective crime redu reduction. When you, when you have those kind of programs, you also reduce other things like school dropouts, um, uh, teen pregnancy, with all the costs associated with that, with social services and Medicaid, uh, with, with, uh, with teen pregnancies. Um, you save a lot more money than you, than, you, than you spend when you use comprehensive evidence-based strategies to reduce crime. Um, it works and it saves money. And the Youth Promise Act uh, takes advantage of that, um, uh, of that by bringing the community together, They're coming up with an evidence-based plan uh, to reduce crime. Um, and, and first of all, figure out how much money they're wasting in counterproductive incarceration. A lot of communities may find that they're spending in some neighborhoods as much on prisons and teen pregnancy as they are on their school system. I mean, people, nobody's, nobody's looked at the numbers. You know, you send somebody to jail, great, job done. Nobody thinks about how much it, it costs. We had a gang roundup a couple of years ago in Portsmouth where one guy got 50 years, another guy got 35 years. Well, great. Great except the fact if you multiply $30,000 times 50 and $30,000 times uh, 35, you get $2,500,000. Um, in the same city, that was having trouble funding boys and girls clubs. Well, why don't you spend a million dollars locking the kids up and have a million and a half left over for the boys and girls club? Well, figure out what you're spending, comprehensive plan, Youth Promise Act will fund the plan, and then you have to evaluate it to make sure it works, and you have to recapture the savings because everybody knows you're gonna save money. As the groups save money, get them to kick back in to keep the programs going so that once you've spent the money once, you're not coming back for more. Um, like I said, the program has, the Youth Promise Act has significant support in the House. We've got over 90 co-sponsors already, and uh, Mary Landrew, and uh, the Republican Senator from Oklahoma, um, uh, Inhofe, are sponsoring it, the bipartisan support in the Senate, and they're working to get uh, other co-sponsors. So I think we're looking uh, much better than we have in the past. Uh, it is a different way to look at juvenile crime. The other way to look at it is to wait for them to drop out, join a gang, mess up, get caught, and then fix and pose some slogan-based sentence that violates common sense and say you did something. Um, I think the Youth Promise Act is a much better approach. And, you, and also a minute or two on, on the Education and Workforce Committee where you're, you're working on the issues there too. Well, the, um, one of the things, uh, we're trying to make college more affordable. Uh, we haven't done very well. Part of the problem with the budget is we spent all our money on January 1st on tax cuts, $3.9 trillion, did not deal with the $1.2 trillion sequester, and that's why we're in the crunch we're in now. Uh, student loan interest was at 3.4 percent. Uh, it was scheduled to double to 6.8 percent. Uh, we kept it down below 4 percent, but higher than it was uh, before. Um, but affordability of college is a question, like many others, of the budget. And um, having spent $3.9 trillion ex extending tax cuts earlier in the year uh, meant that we do not, did not have the money uh, to make college more affordable for students. We ought to be significantly increasing Pell Grants, uh, significantly reducing the interest on student loans. A lot of people uh, my age worked their way through college. They, mm -hmm. It's the work summer job, waiting tables, and they can make enough money to pay tuition and, 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 and uh, get through college. Uh, you can work a 40-hour-a-week job now and not be able to afford, uh, afford to go to college. And people are coming out of debt. And these people work their way through college. When I, when I was in college, would come out with virtually no debt. Now people are coming out of, out of school with 10, 20, 50,000. Graduate school, $100,000 in debt. Is not a, that's not unusual. Uh, we need to make, make sure that people are encouraged. We don't want young people to look at the financial situation and say, I can't afford to go to college. I mean, you look at the life options available to somebody with a college education compared to just a high school education, you, it, it is unseemly to deny those opportunities uh, based on inability to, to afford college. 
Congressman Bobby Scott, it's good to hear you talk about these issues because it, it brings back memories to those of us who saw you serve here in Richmond because you're working on the national scene on issues that were near and dear to your heart and to your leadership when you were here in the General Assembly. And, yeah. and thank you so much for being on This Week in Richmond, and we, we look forward to this having you back for another time. Well, thank you, Dave. Thank you. This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. Alpha Natural Resources, an energy company dedicated to respecting the land. Alpha Natural Resources, we power the world through the energy of our people. Haley Buick GMC, the place for a new Verano or Terrain Denali. In Richmond and online at HaleyBuickGMC.com. Everywhere there are lighting poles, there's one more opportunity to save money. Intelligent Illuminations provides cost-effective wireless lighting solutions for roadway or area outdoor lights. Kanawha Valley Arena, Virginia's cowboy town, hosting an array of events from Civil War reenactments to diesel truck pulls. More information online at VirginiaRodeo.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community, working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. So what do you do? Information about getting involved in advanced technology careers, making everything from clean energy to life-saving medicine, is available at dreamitdoitvirginia.com. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you.